I know this because they always love me. Okay, so I introduced the idea of the exterior derivative um, in the last lecture and said that it's a generalization. I showed you by an example that a generalization of um, all of these vector derivatives that you're already familiar with, thank you. All right, so the graph, all that stuff is just the exterior derivative acting on um, forms of different types. So today I want to continue with that and point out some of the really interesting facts about the exterior derivative, which will lead us to um, the idea of um, the round homology groups, uh, uh, the round homology groups in this. Um, and then from there, um, well, I just want to kind of make it as a throwaway comment today, but we'll, we'll get back to this in the next we'll explore some of the consequences of, uh, of these groups. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the idea of the interior product is something that does the opposite. So, where the exterior derivative of a, a D form to a P plus one form, the interior product. Takes us from a P form to a P minus one form. Okay. So we'll set all of that up today and I'll tell you what the idea behind um, homology is um, as we go along. So essentially, D as a map from the set of P forms on M to the set of P plus one forms on M. Induces um, something called an exact sequence. In the sense that starting from the empty set, by an inclusion map, I can go to a set of functions on it, which in this context is the set of uh, one forms on it. And then after a set of one forms on it, with the operator D1, that this was technically speaking DP, that's on a set of P forms, so it would be D one forms, take me to the set of one forms. On M, and then D, sorry, D zero, D one axiom, no, yes, D one axiom line. These two forms, etc., and this goes all the way through to D M minus one, and then down it on that fold that takes me to um, D M. And since there are now M plus one forms on an n-dimensional landfall. <clears throat> this is zero. So we'll come back to the exact structure of this exact sequence um, in a little bit when we talk about the homology groups and where these mappings actually work. Let me tell you a little bit about the properties of um, the derivative that make it interesting. The first point I would like to note is given some, um, let's say, also some omega in omega r on n, d in principle dr acting on omega. Um, and I want to keep the subscript here for these um, uh, points just because I want to distinguish from the disintegrator between um, forms. So we are actually this R form, um, and this thing lives in omega R plus one. Okay. So it's an R plus one form. Um, but more precisely, it lives in. The image 
of yeah, so this is the set of all things that you are mapping. But we cannot be putting there. If I act again, the sum to the R plus one because it's the R plus one part. And because D is no limit, that uh, this is zero, which means that TR omega lies in the set of all things that dr plus one maps to zero. In other words, it lies in the kernel of dr plus one. What it means is that the image of dr subset of the kernel of dr plus one. Elements of the plus of the kernel of the plus one, things that live in the kernel of the plus one, and things that are all um, <clears throat> of the form d omega equals zero. So any form, any form uh, whose exterior derivative is zero is what we call a closed form. Question. The image be equal to the channel or the sticky function in the channel. Can the image be? Um, it's let's think of an example here. Really. Um, I think for all non trivial examples, it's strictly contained, but let me think about that. Um, so, elements of the kernel of D um, Any form omega such that the omega is zero for closed forms. Moreover, um, elements of the image of the R minus one forms um, are all um, elements of the image of the R minus one. Yeah, so elements of the image of dr minus one are all forms. Um, that means some omega living in omega r on m such that we can find some. Time that's an R minus one form with omega equals to each side. These are called exact forms. So clearly all exact forms, so form 
wants to appear as T of something are necessarily closed because if I take E omega, then that identity is zero because E squared is zero. So all exact forms are closed. But the converse is not necessarily true. In fact, the whole idea of homology asks the question when is um, when is a closed form exact? So if I have some form that I give you, omega, and you know that the omega is zero, can you necessarily write that omega as d or something else? The question is um, <laughs> So when those forms are exact is encoded in the quotient space in my kernel of D R modeled out by the image of D R minus R. Um, and this is called the R the wrong homology the wrong homology. Structure and you know what this group is, etc. We will come back to um what the end of the course when we focus a little bit on um on the homology groups in the algorithms. Um the point that I made last time now and is the fact that. I call something a derivative if it satisfies the product rule, if it is if it has the limit property or what we call the property of derivation. So normally we insist on things that um, look like derivatives, they are derivatives if they are derivations, they satisfy limits. Um, and then I showed you that actually this exterior derivative is all of the derivatives that you're familiar with from um x from <clears throat> from vector calculus technique. Uh, there's a caveat. The caveat is that it's not strictly a derivation. It's not strictly a derivation because of the way it acts on um, on uh, forms. So tell you what it is about it. Derivation. The sense that it does not satisfy a uh, strict Leibniz property, it satisfies a variant on it that depends on the degree of the forms it's acting. Um, so if I take two forms, let's say um, omega being an R form. And eta being an S form. <clears throat> then statement here is that D of omega 
where eta, the exterior product of omega and eta, is d of omega, which eta, and if it was a derivation, then this would also, the next term would be plus omega where t eta, but it's not. It's actually minus one to the r to the degree of the first thing there, which is omega, omega which why? Because when I act on omega wave beta, I'm really only acting on the basis forms. Right? Um, so whatever the components are, I can always just pull those out, and then I'm acting on basis forms. The first set of basis forms is fine. It takes a little bit of all the components of omega. There's one more um, basis one form I need to chuck in there, and it's organized at the front of everything. So that's fine. This guy to take the basic form associated to uh, eta and, and have a you know dx lambda where it's dx mu uh, one to mu s. I have to shuffle that guy through r um, uh, dxs. Every time I, 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 I commute, it pulls up the minus one. So I've got to do it all times to get minus one to the other. So that's where this minus one to the one is. And the fact that I've got this. Greater feature here you know, where um, it's either plus or minus one, depending on the, on the degree of false form, is what makes it an anti Um Okay, so so far we've defined the action of um, BK, BR, I guess. Um, we've defined the action of BR um, in terms of. Uh, some chosen basis for a set of R blocks. You might think, well, you know, this is how we do it, but actually, pretty much everything that we do in differential geometry can be done in a quarterly independent way. Quarterly independent way, as I've said before, is often sometimes it's often more powerful than the quarterly dependent way because it it allows you to express some of the inherent geometry. So. We're going to need a lot of these properties going forward, and I'd like to do it in a coordinate independent way as I, as I can. Right at the end of the day, if you want to do some calculations, you actually want to calculate the extended derivative, then you need to pick some set of coordinates and you will need to introduce indices and you need to take curves. But if you're interested in the structures um, underlying these objects, then you don't. So let's do a coordinate independent formulation of what the exterior derivative is. Uh, uh, so, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to motivate for this form um, with a one form. And then, because it's really independent of A, the coordinates we choose, and B, the, the degrees of the forms, once I write it down to the one form, I'm going to take it as a leap of faith and write down the, the results by extension. And then you can verify that if you like. So you can check it directly, but it's a pain in the butt and more of not doing this. Okay, so suppose so to give a coordinate independent. Relation Let's start with giving some importance. Um, so suppose, suppose I've got um, a vector X. Um, and y, x is x mean, some set of coordinates mean mean, and y is y mean, d mean, these are both vectors on f, and I have some omega, um, which lives in omega. One there. Okay. 
So now let's see how we need to cover um, G omega x. So notice the following. D omega, omega is one form and a two form. Right? And as a two form, it takes two vectors and gives you back a real number. So that means that this guy has an argument, two vectors, which I'm going to take to be x and y. So let's evaluate this component and then we'll make some, uh, I'll, I'll show you something else. I'll be back to that, that same form. So this is equal to this guy here is D lambda omega mu. Dx lambda, which dx mu, and this is acting on x1. This here um, is a two form. To evaluate the action of this two form, I need to break it up into a sense of uh, tensor product components. It gives us the anti symmetrized uh, test product, right? So that's d lambda omega mu dx lambda. And I'll do this once in detail, and then this is how it works minus d dx mu and dx lambda. And this acts on x y. This is just dx, so d lambda omega mu. <laughs> this guy acts on this, this guy acts on this, this guy acts on this, this guy acts on this. So this is um, x lambda y mu minus um, x mu y lambda. So let's leave that aside. On the other hand, notice the point that omega evaluated on one of these vectors, y, is a number. Omega is a one form, it maps a vector to a number. Uh, that's a function. Um, some, well, yeah, some real number. So I can then act on that with x as a derivative operator. So x on omega of y. This is just x mu e mu on omega of y. Omega of y is omega mu y mu. This is a possible derivative operator. It's a it satisfied weakness. So um, this is just x mu d mu omega mu and y mu plus x mu omega mu d mu y mu. Do the same thing with y. Evaluated on omega of x. That's just x and y with k. So this is just y mu d mu omega mu x mu plus y mu omega mu d mu x mu. And then finally, Omega being a one form um, can act on a vector. And the vector that is what you look at in particular is the lead reference between x and y. Okay, so this is just omega mu x mu g mu y mu minus. Omega mu, y 
And if I go x evaluated at um, omega of y minus y evaluated at omega of x minus um, omega of x bracket y, then I get Precisely, yes. yes. The new omega new times x new by a minus x new by a. In other words, for one form, I have the expression that d omega. Evaluated on the test vectors x and y is just x of omega one minus y of omega of x minus omega of the brackets. So the key thing about this is that the yellow expression. Doesn't actually, even though I derived it by resorting to um, coordinates, this expression is coordinate independent. I can give you any set of coordinates you want, pick whatever vectors you want, they just check vectors anyway, whichever one you want, and this expression holds true. So, this is the action of the exterior derivative on some uh, one form. More generally, And there's two ways to do this. Either you can go ahead and do this for a p-form and see if you can spot the uh, for a two-form, the action of the two form and see if you can spot a pattern. Or I'm giving you the thing, you can verify it. Um, if you spot a pattern, then you can use induction to get the same result, but um it depends on that. So more generally, if I've got some um R form omega. And the following is true. D omega is an R plus one form that acts on seven R plus one vectors. Let's call them X R plus one, uh, X one to X R plus one. And this is the sum from let's say i equals one to r plus to r minus one to r plus one x i this i omega of x one all the way through to um, x. I, and what I want you to do here is to leave out xi. So this hat over means you get to the i position and you exclude that vector. Okay. Um, and then your thumb due to xi plus one. So there are plus one of these guys with one of them removed. There are vectors in here, which is exactly the number that you need um, for an R form operator. Okay. And you can see that this sum here, this alternating sum here, will give you these two types of terms. Yeah. Is the next one minus one plus 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 Sum of i less than j bar of minus one 
to the pi plus j of omega r. X i y j x one two two x i again the f means drop x i two to x j and the f means drop x j all the way to x r plus r. Okay, so basically this term will have terms where omega x and on R um, vectors, we have a list of uh, yeah. You have a list of R plus one vectors. You drop x i and x j and you replace them. Right, the you drop x i and x j and you replace them at the front with um, with the D bracket between two, and that's a general expression. For uh, a general quarter independent expression for the action of the exterior, uh, they don't depend on YouTube performance, they're rather dependent uh, in any performance on your mind. Wait, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it should be something so hard, we never had the last one. So J can't ever be R plus one in that sum. J can't ever be R plus one in that sum. So you can always meet the bottom. Oh. Um yeah, it turns out else it's weird. Uh, what? So, so that would also like the I have one R. Yeah, like it's going to be X or the point of the bit of R times. Then, um, you ever have X R plus one omega or star? It's something for one R. Uh, Never have that kind of strong index of this one. If the index runs from i, so the index runs from i equals one to r. So let's pretend that's good. R equals two. Um, no, sorry. R equals one. If r equals one, two terms. It should be R plus one. It should be R plus one. That's is that your question? Yeah, and the other the other answer. That that would be R plus one. Right. So let's do an example to finish this off. Um. And this example of the well to dynamics. There are two things that are particularly well framed in this, in this language. One is natural electrodynamics, um, and the other one is um, classical mechanics. We need one more tool in our toolkit before we can reformulate classical mechanics, um, classical Hamiltonian mechanics. But at least half of actual electrodynamics, if you talk about half. The other half, I need something else for as well. Um, so, classical electrodynamics, actual electrodynamics, um, is usually framed as a set of differential equations for the electric and magnetic field that need to be solved subject to some set of mounting equations. So, <laughs> These are called Maxwell's equations. They're not the form that Maxwell gave them. Maxwell gave them an integral form, but today we realize that um, they can be written in a differential form, and the differential form is 
Das ist auch ein Teil der Bewegung, dass wir das wirklich mal da haben. So the critical content of these equations are as follows. This the statement here is that electric charges produce electric fields. Um, changing electric fields produce magnetic fields. There are no magnetic monopoles, and changing electric fields produce magnetic fields. Right. So this is the critical context, the content of these four equations. So this is the statement that um, changing Electric fields use magnetic fields. This is the same magnetic fields. Use electric fields. This tells us that um, charges, electric charges, source electric fields. So the statement that there are no magnetic monopoles. Okay. Um, so these two, the, the, the physical statement associated to these two equations, you can test it by um, taking a magnet and putting it into a coil of wire. If you move the magnet, um, that produces a changing magnetic flux. That, that induces the electric field in the wire. If you keep the magnet um, fixed and you and you turn on a current in the wire, that produces an electric charge which repels the magnet. So changing magnetic fields produce electric fields, changing electric fields produce magnetic fields. So it's quite a little conduction. This says that if I have some electric um, uh, source like an electron or proton, and I put it somewhere, and that will produce an electric field. This says that there, are, there is no equivalent of that in uh, for a magnetic field. A magnetic fields only come far magnets produce electric, they produce magnetic fields and they always come more than some of So there's no magnetic monopole that you find for an electric monopole. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, there is an enormous amount to be learned from even these simple equations which we teach you in first year. Yeah. The, if you look at these equations, and in fact, if you put this to zero, so you look at the axle of the equations in the vacuum, you say this delta E is zero as well. Um, then just staring at that, you can see that those equations are invariant if you exchange the magnetic field minus the electric field. That seems like a rather prosaic, obvious thing to, to note, but it's an example of what we call electric magnetic duality. And electric magnetic duality, this particular electric magnetic duality, led to one of the one of the deepest advances in pure mathematics in the last decade. Um, so there's a, there's a program called the, the Langlands conjecture, which is kind of a unified theory of mathematics, if you want. Um, and you know, it's it's been it was proposed by by Langlands uh, a long time ago, and every now and then there's a little spurt of development that occurred in the Langlands. Well, one of the most recent. The biggest um, development is what, what's called geometric Langlands conjecture. Um, and the geometric Langlands conjecture and the developments on the geometric Langlands conjecture were really worked out by Edward Witten um, and Anton Kapustin. And they were studying these equations, or a slight generalization of these equations in a differential form. Um, so there's a lot of really, really deep mathematics tied to you know, even these rather simple equations. 
However, I don't want to talk too much about that um, right now. Um, what I do want to tell you about, though, is the statement of the equations here tells me that I can formulate um, the electric field and magnetic field um, in terms of potential. Right. Normally, we don't think about these potentials because they are not observables. The observables in the theory of the electric and magnetic fields, these are the things you can measure. The potentials are just there because their derivatives are the things you can measure. Their derivatives are the electric and mechanic fields. These come from looking at the equation here. In particular, this equation and this equation here tell me that um, the electric field and E can be written as minus the gradient of some scalar uh, minus um, the time derivative of some vector. Okay, and the magnetic field can be written as a curve of the same vector. So these things are called the scalar and vector potentials, effectively. Potential. And normally we don't, you know, they're just a they're just a nice thing to have around in that In quantum mechanics, on the other hand, the vector potential is a measurable quantity. So you can't just discard it whenever you want and say, well, it's only instead of that matters. You can actually measure it with an experiment called the Aron Aron Bohm experiment that measures um, this. Uh, vector potential, and that in itself is tied to some deep geometry. And the deep geometry is there, it's um, the idea of homotopy that you can have spaces with holes in them. The fact that you have a hole in the, in the space means that if you make a path going around that hole, then it's got a non trivial winding. So it's tied to each of the topology of the, um, of the bottom. Okay, <clears throat> again, I don't really want to talk about this. What I want to tell you about though is the fact that. We can formulate Maxwell equations geometric. Okay, the caveat here is that I formulate two of the Maxwell equations geometrically. The other two actually involve some, some dynamics. Which one's going to formulate geometrically? Well, this one is the statement that curves don't have divergence. So a vector field that looks like a curl is something that's curling around, it's not going anywhere, so it's that in divergence. Divergence of the curve vanishes. Look at this one, for example. Right? Um, if you take the, the curve gradient, that's zero. Okay, so that's a statement that a gradient field is gradiently pointing outwards and doesn't curl anything. These are geometrical statements. They're not statements about any electrodynamics of any sort. So two of these equations can be expressed um, purely geometrically. The other two require you to formulate some dynamics, and we'll come to that a little bit later when we learn about our stuff. But the point is the point. I can take the scalar potential and the vector potential, the vector potential, they are three components in the three dimensional space. So there's three from here, one from here. And I can write it down as a so identify a naught, just speaking of convention, as minus phi and a one. Um, uh, let's say AI with this vector, this vector is I component. Uh, so this is the three vector the, with the arrow over it, and this is what's typically called a four vector. So these then become um, they're captured in a mu, which is a naught one. A two A P. This is called the right vector problem. So this guy here is what's called this is known for four vector. But the difference would say this is nothing but the components of a one side.
So A mu dx mu, the mu downstairs here, is just the one form. And this is this one form is called. One form is called the uh, electromagnetic potential. And associated to this one form is a two form. Yes. And it is DA. So this two form F is necessarily exact. And only that form that goes. So this two form satisfies the DX D squared A. Is zero. These, this yeah, DF equals zero. It's precisely the two geometrical um, uh, Maxwell equations. That's all it is. It's a statement that D squared is equal to zero, and the fact that um, uh, the two form here is an exact example. Which two form is this? This is what two form is not an Its components are precisely zero minus e one minus uh, let's say the x minus e one minus e z. So this is the x one that can form with the electric field. Um, so that's e x y e z zero. B Z minus B Y um, minus C Z B Y zero and then this is X so it's nice yes in show calculating this E and doing um, taking the numbers um, but these equations here. Are two of the maximum equations. The statement that curls have no divergence and gradients have no curl. Okay. So, if we stop there for today, um, we'll pick up again. Oh, wait, next week's holiday. So we'll pick up again Monday of the holiday, and we'll introduce the idea of the interior product um, as a punch star operator, um, which maps up between P forms and M minus P forms. And then with those two things, I'll do two more things. One is I'll show you where the second set of Maxwell equations come from. And the other one is we'll then take all of the technology and we'll reformulate classical mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics. In this language of um, differential geometry, right? Um, where capital mechanics is nothing but the geometry of syntactic functions. No, um, I'll tell you why just now. Yeah.